Shall we go ahead and get started? Okay, great. So well, welcome uh, to the first event in our Innovating Illinois Rural Health series. I'm Gene Besant. I'm the moderator for today's uh, program. I'm a retired member of the faculties at both the SIU School of Law and the SIU School of Medicine. We're privileged today uh, to sit in on a conversation between two uh, well-informed health policy experts, the Honorable Eric Hargan and Dr. Samir Vohra. Let me just give you a little information about our, our uh, two experts today before we get started. The Honorable Eric Hargan is the founder and CEO of the Hargan Group, uh, a full-service consulting firm with extensive expertise in regulatory guidance, public health innovations, and strategic public policy solutions. He has 30 years of experience working for the public and private sectors and unique insights and experience working for the United States government. He served as the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services from 2017 to 2021, as well as the Acting Secretary in 2017 and 18. From 2003 to 2007, Mr. Hargan also served as at HHS in a variety of, variety of capacities, including holding the position of acting deputy secretary. With over 80,000 employees across 26 divisions, HHS is the largest department of the federal government and has an annual budget in excess of $1.3 trillion, which is in fact larger than many nations uh, around, uh, around the world. Our other participant today is Dr. Samir Vohra, uh, the founding chair of the SIU School of Medicine's Department of Population Science and Policy, which is a mission-driven research and policy academic department aiming to improve health outcomes in central and southern Illinois. Uh, Dr. Vora has received several honors, most recently being named a Presidential Leadership Scholar in 2020, chosen by the George W. Bush Presidential C uh, Center, the Clinton Presidential Center, the George and Barbara Bush Foundation, and the LBJ Foundation. So welcome to all our participants and welcome to Dr. Vora and Mr. Hargan. Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, as I mentioned, this is the first in a series uh, of uh, uh, innovation in rural health uh, uh, program programs uh, that will be held. And Dr. Vora, you wanna take a couple of minutes to explain what will be happening uh, in this series? Thanks so much, Professor Besant, I'd be happy to. The Innovating Illinois Rural Health event series um, is a process that we'll be going through over the next year to really combine two innovative programs that SIU, schools of law, the Southern Illinois healthcare system, and the SIU School of Medicine has been performing for a number of years. Uh, first and foremost, uh, that the work start started with the SIH SIU Health Policy Institute. And the SIU SIH Health Policy Institute was first held back in 1999 in Macanda, Illinois, and at that time focused on managed care. Over the last um, 21 years, we've really sort of evolved that Health Policy Institute to think about different aspects of healthcare and the intersection of medical, legal, and policy efforts that try to promote health equity. This unique health policy institute has allowed opportunities for individuals across the state of Illinois and even some folks nationally to really understand unique health issues and how they interact with the state of Illinois. The Illinois Rural Health Summit it dates all the way back to 2003 when the late great Senator Paul Simon first 
came up with the idea of how could we combine innovative discussions and partners to come together to really address rural health issues in Illinois. The rural health policy work sort of put forward by the Illinois Rural Health Summit really reconvened back in 2018 with a partnership between the SIU School of Medicine, Department of Population Science and Policy, the SIU Paul Simon Public Policy Institute, the SIU Medicine Center for Rural Health and Social Dis Service Development, and the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health. The work in 2018 led to innovative conversations and partnerships between healthcare, public health, the legal community, social service, philanthropy, academia, and community leaders to really begin building blueprints around innovations and policy directions that the state of Illinois could do to promote rural health and to make rural health in Illinois improve. That resulted in 10 briefs and a number of webinars, both in 2021 and 2022, that dove much deeper around issues like children's growth and development, the aging population, health workforce, housing and homelessness, public health systems, nutrition and fitness, opioid use, and mental health. And so we have this QR code for those that are interested in really going back and seeing those briefs, recording of those webinars, those are there for everybody's view. And now as we morph into this Innovating Illinois Rural Health Summit series, we wanna go deeper into those issues, provide examples of innovations, and we're so honored to have uh, Professor Basanta and Mr. Hargan uh, cap off this unique series with a really in-depth conversation around the federal and state considerations around rural health. So back to you, Professor Basanta. Well, great, uh, Dr. Bower. Thanks for uh, uh, that introduction and explanation, and we really look forward to uh, subsequent uh, uh, pieces of of the program as as uh, time goes by. Um, so let's get started, uh, and and I think to guide and facilitate our conversation uh, today, uh, we've we have several questions. Uh, to focus on. Uh, so let me sort of pose the first question sure. and and uh, we'll we'll begin there. Uh, so rural communities face lots of lots of challenges. We know that. Uh, and in particular, they face challenges in receiving quality, timely health care. Um, so what are those challenges in terms of receiving timely and quality health care? And how do those challenges impact? the health status of people living in rural communities. Um, I'll let either of you start off uh, the conversation. I guess, Doctor, I'll, I'll take a stab at that and you can join in or contradict at your, <laughs> at your <laughs> leisure. Um, so, I mean, you start with the state, I mean, just the fact of rurality, right? The fact that it's a rural area, you're dealing with the problem of people being at great distances from each other, it's remote. Uh, and it's and it is always relatively unpopulated. It wouldn't be rural otherwise. Um, that imposes just to start off with. You start with a logistical problem of bringing healthcare to a population that's distant, and remote, and kind of spread out. Uh, that's just that's a start. Then you add to that that in the United States, the rural population is generally older. It's generally sicker, um, and in in not in every place, but sometimes it's also poorer. And more dependent on uh, on different systems, not the kind of the, the kind of sort of suburban hospital systems and academic medical centers and so on uh, that are available to other populations in other areas. So you start off with generally a problem of distance, transportation, the fact of the characteristics of the population, and that just starts out from like problematic area. Uh, for delivery of healthcare services, and that sort of sets the stage uh, for what what has turned out to be a, a complex problem of delivering quality care uh, to rural population. Uh, I mean, I know this firsthand. I grew up underfoot in a rural hospital. My mother worked at 58 years in Cairo, 
uh, Illinois. Uh, that can be more more southern in Illinois and still be part of Illinois, uh, where she worked. And this is a there would be a classic illustration. Is it started off as a hospital? Uh, it's now a federally qualified health center. Uh, you know, and eventually that that you go by that it's it, building isn't even really standing anymore. Uh, that was uh, in its day St. Mary's, Padco, Southern Medical Center, and all the many renamings of that hospital as it gradually disappeared. Um, and became a clinic. Still doing great work, mission-driven work, but it's different. It's it's the it's the sort of to my mind that's very much personally a symbol of what has happened in rural America with regard to healthcare. Now that's not that's kind of a sad story, but also I think that there are many many opportunities for now for improvement, and many of those are relatively recent. But I'm going to start there with the challenges um, because I think we had a question about the challenges. That's my personal view of, of the challenges and the impact on that is, and I'll say some of the impacts on that are obviously uh, the fact that you can't have specialty care everywhere in rural America. For example, I'm from a town, Mounds, about 800 people. You couldn't have 800 specialists move to Mounds and each treat each other. This makes no sense. You're never going to have some of these small communities have that kind of direct access to specialist care that you would want them to have, at least not physically in their community, because they're just it just doesn't exist. That doesn't mean we can't have access to specialty care, that advice and those services in a rural community. Uh, but I'm just going to say that's one of the impacts that you have on a rural community is there are going to be lacks of access to those things, and there are going to be extra costs imposed on the rural community, either in time, in getting to a site of care, in cost, in getting to a site of care, uh, if they're going to do it in person. Those may seem pretty obvious, but at least I want to set the table there for some of the challenges and the impacts that are imposed by just being in the area of rural health care. Doctor, do you have anything to add or differences with that? Yeah, no, thank, thanks so much, um, Mr. Hargan. I, I think that that is sort of the, the central challenge of, well, when you are more remote, when you don't have as much population, how do you think about the right kind of delivery of care? Um, and then you have a population of folks in those rural communities that tend to be sicker. You know, a lot of the data shows that the five leading causes of death, people in rural communities struggle with that more than urban communities. Um, well, how do you think through that problem? And, and the way that we have thought about it really is these sort of five Ds, right? So we started a little bit of this disadvantage that people in rural communities, when we look at the data, tend to be unhealthy, they lack some of that access. And it's because you know, the deserts of essential services that the rural communities often just don't have the population to support. Mr. Argan, you mentioned specialists. I think that is, is a key, uh, especially when we think through you know, health service shortage areas. You know, we know that 80 of the 102 counties um, in Illinois, don't have a child or adolescent psychiatrist, right? And we look at, we do talk about a number of specialties that goes into deserts, but those deserts also exist in terms of grocery stores. Those deserts exist in terms of child care centers. And so we combine the lack of access of healthcare services with some of the things that we could use to make ourselves healthier. And then we see, you know, the third D, that disadvantage, deserts are often also disconnection, right? Rural communities are uniquely built where people know each other, right? And I think that's been some of the great pleasures of being able to travel to these rural communities where, you know, all of a sudden you could walk in and you could have a meeting with the mayor of the town, the superintendent of the school, the head of the clinic or hospital, which if you would try to make that meeting in a big city might take, you know, months to plan. But often the systems in which they're coordinated don't necessarily allow for that connection. And I think that creates some of those, you know, inequities, some of those challenges, those differences that are can be very similar with low income urban communities and rural communities. But how do we think about the fifth D that disadvantage that so how do we think about development opportunities, right? So what 
if we have those disparities as the fourth B, how can we uniquely know that the culture of rural communities are different? The, the services are different. And we have to think about uniquely tailored developmental opportunities that fit within those uh, rural systems and really fit in with the way and the community and culture of those rural communities. Yeah, I'll just add my two cents here. I do think, you know, uh, um, transportation in in rural southern Illinois, getting to the doctor's office is as big a challenge as any that I think people face. Um, it's it's it, and and uh, systems really have to work to address that, figure out how are we going to get people who need care from where they live to where they get it, or how are we going to take that care to them where they live? Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 innovations in that area seem very important to me in rural Illinois, rural America. Yeah. Um, let me let me transition to another connect uh, 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 topic uh, or, or question. Um, in terms of policy. In, in, and and um, rural communities, healthcare, health policy, where are things not right now, not fitting together? Where is there a disconnect between rural communities and health public policy? What, what, why is there, where are there conflicts or not, not fitting together? Um, Doctor, do you want to start off, Eric? You want me? To, okay, I'll I'll start with that uh, that one as well. You know, one of the difficulties is that rural communities are so they're spread out everywhere. They're all over the place. I mean, everywhere from you know Alaska, the northern slope of Alaska, to you know the, the tribal lands in the southwest, to you know forests in Maine, and of course our own beloved Midwest, right? They're everywhere. And it's hard to speak with a unified voice in many ways. So to get into the policy debates that take place, where they're taking place, there's sort of an inherent disconnect on people being able to kind of say, not this is for me, but this is a problem that we all, that 60 million plus Americans who are in rural areas share. Uh, there is a disconnect because there's often not a unit in my, this is my perspective, only there's a there's a disconnect because there's not there aren't very many voices speaking up for that particular area as a whole nationally there's a lot of little voices right but there aren't a lot of big voices uh, speaking in this area and that's a problem right and they need to people frankly rural america needs to speak up about the issues particularly that are in healthcare the you know we saw this disconnect during the pandemic, and actually because of the telehealth, the revolution that took place in telehealth and telemedicine, the amount of attention that has been placed on that in short order, once it was expanded away from just being a rural area into being available to everyone, suddenly innovation is happening at a breakneck speed in that area. When it was rural only, not much. Okay, now that it's for everyone, there's a ton of innovation happening in the area from a practical point of view, how to connect people to things, what kind of what kind of new things can happen on remote patient monitoring, on being able to do virtual check-ins, being able to take that care from where they are to the patient, maybe not even physically, patient education. I mean, how, how to like bring information in a very digestible way to the patient remotely being able to monitor that patient, being able to deliver lots of care in very unusual ways, in a mobile way, but also allowing the patient to take care of their own themselves and have the information and access to what they need to do to take care of themselves and educate themselves or their loved ones in the case where you have people taking caretakers and caregivers in the local community. To be able to do that is, a, it's revolutionary. I mean, I think we're at the beginning of that. I hope so. I hope what we're doing now looks crude in a few years and that we have, what we see now is just the beginning of it. 
but if but see rural america is benefiting from something that's taking place outside of it and that is always the danger right is that now everyone's interested in telehealth telemedicine and everybody in rural america is going to benefit from that because disproportionate which is i think great news but there's there's technology coming and a lot of ways of reconnecting with people but that took that's something that should have happened years ago for rural America, but it didn't happen because no one would focus on it because there was that policy disconnect, the fact that people weren't in there. And some of it's natural. I mean, like, look, I I got, you know, we did the Rural Health Action Plan that we launched uh, in late 2020. And, you know, it's a stack of things that can be taken advantage of, lots of things. But even while I was helping put that together and kind of like sort of helping to lead the effort on that, naturally, given, you know, my natural interest in this. Even so, I thought to myself, what in the world is a community health center in Carroll, Illinois going to do with this? You know, there's that, there's that disconnect coming from, even if people are trying to be helpful at the federal national level, how do you translate that? How do you put the gears in between the attempt to help and it actually helping rural communities? And, and, the, and the care providers and the patients in that community, because I can't even imagine somebody say, who is going to do that? You know, when you have a staff, a handful of people, who's going to sit down and read some big federal book on rural health, on rural health, uh, even if it could be helpful, it's difficult to translate these things. So I think that's a whole, that could be a whole effort in and of itself is to not just have the gears where they run from rural America to policymakers to to bring those ideas up and those needs up, but also even when they're trying to be helpful, sometimes it can't be helpful because there aren't gears coming the other way that can bring even helpful intentions and resources to the community uh, because Who's, who can take advantage of that? I, I couldn't imagine that being taken advantage of where I am from in Southern Illinois. Who's gonna do that for them? Digest it, bring it to them and say, would this be, couldn't this help you? So that's, those are my sort of dilemmas. There's, there's a gap. And then programs like this, I think are very helpful because they're, they're, you're trying to build those bridges and that information in the community to sort of bring these ideas to the fore, which is what I think needs to happen. Mr. Rogan, I, I think that, that that feels so right. This this challenge um, in two ways. One, well, we know how how policy is made, right? It's it's based around, you know, how people are chosen to represent. And when you're talking about small places with smaller populations, um, then it's going to be difficult to get that voice to a place where you're going to be able to make the policy level decisions, both state and federal. And to the other challenge, which I, I think is something that we have wanted to really say very loudly in some of these spaces is that when we talk about rural, everybody sort of paints it in one brush. But and I know you can speak to this better than almost absolutely anyone, right? Imagining how the difference between um, Gallatin County in Illinois versus remote regions in Alaska. You know, I just got to spend some time in New Mexico and seeing rur rurality in New Mexico, right? And so it's very difficult for us to say that, yes, we have the issues of being remote and being distant to healthcare. But the nuances of that are, are very, very different. And then just the technical nature of policy conversations of even when we say, yes, we think we need to do this, but understanding the different things of like, what does it mean to be a rural health clinic? What does it mean to get the designation to be a critical access hospital? How does that work with the finances that come through? And we won't bore all of our participants with all of those details, but it's really critical when you have, well, here is the intention to help. And I think 
through the policymakers, um, there is a lot of intention to kind of help across rural areas, but how do we find the right kind of expertise to help communities digest some of those things and to know and to really sort of figure out ways to share their stories? Because I think some of the stuff that I know and, and I'll please would love for you to share, Mr. Hargan, with the, the, some of the things that you've seen, but I think even in our travels across Illinois, is that the way that a lot of these communities just roll up their sleeves and say, well, here's just the limited resources we have. We are going to work and build these connections. We're going to do innovative things. We're going to leave the school immediately to help out with this program to make a difference. I mean, that stuff is inspirational. Um, and I think one of the big things for my job being originally from a big city and now having the great opportunity to be able to, to travel and interact with rural communities, you see that innovation happen. But often those stories just don't get the same kind of opportunity to be shared. And I know you have an incredible amount of information and stories from your personal experiences. There, I mean, you know, you look at, you were just talking about New Mexico. So you think of Project ECHO. Not a surprise that Project ECHO kind of training the trainers uh, in this space all across the country using, you know, remote learning uh, to bring all of this training to people came out of New Mexico. Doesn't surprise me Dr. Aurora out there, like, you know, came up with the idea uh, to innovate uh, out of New Mexico because it was so necessary for it to be done. You know, as they say, you know, necessity is the motherhood of invention, right? Is the mother of invention, right? That's That's the... That's the issue right there is that you find all these things, but how do the stories get spread? How do how does the how does the knowledge that can be acquired in these areas from dealing with their particular circumstances? How does it get spread? How does it get elevated and spread so people understand what everyone else is dealing with uh, and learn from it? I mean, there are programs out there, but it's hard to even get that to people and you know and their places are so different you look at a place like southern illinois is dealing with very different circumstances than say northern alaska where the issues are really water systems right things like that sewage disposal things that are basic public health issues in many cases that that are sort of already achieved uh, in a space like southern illinois where you're looking at a very different set of challenges and a different population set that's dealing with a different set of healthcare challenges. So it's a the the ability to kind of also have answers ready when the questions arise. I'll, I'll give you an example. Telehealth, we were dealing with that early on because obviously the pandemic provoked it. We were ready from a policy point of view to deal with it because of the rural health work that we had been doing. We knew we wanted to do something in telehealth, telemedicine. So I reach out to people I know in rural health and say, like, what do you all think about telehealth telemedicine? And there were a lot of voices, a lot of differences of opinion. Some of people were very worried about telehealth. Providers were often worried that they would be outcompeted by big city practices and big city healthcare institutions that would take their the the what they had remaining, they would take their patients and take that work. From them, and so they were alarmed. They were alarmed if we went that direction. They would all kinds of arcane issues. Will we get a facility fee? Like, how are we going to survive unless we have a patient on site and we don't get our facility fee? Like, very practical questions that arose. That and they're practical questions, right? If like they're there, you have to address these issues um, for the for the long term sustainability from a financial point of view of healthcare being provided in these towns. Um, so those issues, there wasn't a unified voice on it. Now, we went ahead and plumped for expanding telehealth and telemedicine. It, you know, in that case, at least we were able to kind of communicate beforehand and at least hear out what people were worried about. And so if problems had arisen, we would at least be knowledgeable that we had made those decisions. But that would have been a peculiar circumstance because you had myself in as the number two at HHS. And of course, I can just call home 
okay, or to people that I know in rural health and say, what's the problem? Or, you know, the, the secretary, Secretary Azar, he, his father was an ophthalmologist in a small town in the eastern shore of Maryland. So we both were acquainted with, now his town wasn't as small as Mounds, but it had been a big town in southern Illinois, to be honest, right? But in the east coast, it's a small town, right? Uh, but, it, you know, there we'd be going like, oh, it's about Murfreesboro, you know, that's about the size of Murfreesboro. So we'd go, okay, that's sizable town. It's certainly bigger than Mounds, Mound City, Perks, We Talk, uh, all those, Olmsted, Grand Chain, Karnak, all those places I know from Pulaski County. So these are all, so when you look at those, when you, that was happenstance, right? That as we, the, the, the question is, how do you replicate that and make sure that that information can be provided, that those solutions and those perspectives are available to be provided to policymakers when opportunity arises. Because that turned out to be a positive thing. Even later on, I kept checking in going, how's it going, right? How's it going? Is it still going okay? And at the end, I was hearing anecdotes, and that anecdotes are what they are, they're not data, but that people said, well, now our patients are staying in place because we can provide specialist care remotely. And so they now feel comfortable staying in the hospital with their primary care doctor and their nurses and the people that they know, and they know the specialty care is available remotely. So they are inclined to stay in place in their community if they can, um, and don't want to move and decamp to a city to get that specialty care in person. So that's anecdotes. I'm, I'm not going to say that that's what will bear out over time, but, but those were good reflections. The thing is to be able to get enough data and enough information that is usable when, when the, the occasion arises, as they will over time, to provide that credible perspective from the rural point of view, which again, one out of every six Americans is in a rural area, so it's not nothing. Um, and HHS can just ask their people in-house and they'll get that same answer. But if, if it had been a fractured voice that had come, you know, if I had heard even more, we're worried about telehealth, telemedicine, where might we have gone? Or no answer at all. Um, you never know. But, uh, but so it's important to have these conversations to develop this information and the perspectives to be ready when, as I say, the occasion arises to get in there and help, right? help form the policy that's happening. Yeah, but, and, and, and let me just add, um, but one of the challenges that I've, I've experienced myself, because I live in, in the big city of Murfreesboro, um, you know, so uh, actually I'm in what they refer to as rural Murfreesboro. Um, and uh, the internet, the information technology infrastructure in rural America. It, there's lots of talk about it, and I and I guess lots of action, but it, it is essential for all sorts of things, yeah. remote learning, right? Mm -hmm. Remote uh, tele, telehealth. Um, I, I, I happen to live in a place where I, I don't have Wi-Fi, and I'm only, I'm not that, I'm, I'm four miles from Carbondale, but I'm in a place where there's no Wi-Fi. I have to rely on a hotspot to, um, and so you know, to to that's a disconnect. We have telehealth, and I I've partaken of telehealth, but at the same time, there's a big infrastructure issue in rural rural America, uh, an information uh, infrastructure that's part of this, the, the, the you know the quality of care that rural Americans receive and will receive in the future. Yeah. So, um, the next question that, that we want to consider is um, what, what change is possible at the local and state levels and where do federal policies fit in terms of promoting, incentivizing um, uh, more rural health improvement? What, yeah. what, so, so what is possible locally and, and, and at the state level? And where's the federal government fit in that? 
So, Doctor, do you want to talk about? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd be happy to start. I mean, I, I think there there is an opportunity, and, and as as Mr. Hargan said, I, I think telehealth is one of those things where how can we almost reexamine the way that we deliver healthcare, right? That you know the standard way of you go to a clinic and you get seen by somebody or you go to the hospital. I think we should openly ask, does that make sense anymore? Right? And and especially when that is so hard to do in these kind of remote populations in geography, right? And then I think, so we asked that one question. So we have now technological opportunities. I think Professor Brissanti, you're absolutely right. Not everybody has the same technological infrastructure and that feels like an important thing that we have to go about. I think in, in one of our, our final briefs, we were able to see that we there was a study that came through that in 52 of our 102 counties in Illinois, 75% or more of households lacked high-speed internet, right? And so that, that in itself makes it very difficult to be able to kind of do the things that you said. But we know that we can do telehealth, right? And I, I think, you know, SIU sort of really was one of those things invested in that. I know all kind of healthcare systems um, across the state and the country did. But to that point, how do we do it with the right kind of quality? Because we know that providers like it when they can do it the right way. We know that patients like it when we can do it the right way. So I think that's one big thing of, and we know remote patient monitoring, we can get all this information in ways that previously, maybe you did have to go to a clinic or hospital too. I think the second big thing is you know, we talk about the idea of like, well, what what is a public health function? What is a healthcare function? What is a social service function, right? And those do bleed together, right, sometimes. And I think COVID was a really good example of, you know, not everything that we did perfectly, but the idea that we had to work in unison around public health, healthcare, and social service, right? Well, what were we gonna do with our our homeless population in a lot of communities? What were we gonna do when, you know, public health needed to figure out partnerships with healthcare? And I think, you know, and, and I know Mr. Hargan can speak to this more, is that that hasn't been a perfect place for partnership, you know, throughout our recent and then sort of long-term history. And then the third thing I would say there is, we talked about in rural communities, somebody can get on the phone and you can have decision makers meet very quickly. But if our systems aren't built for schools to partner with hospitals, we aren't linked in payment where somebody could get mental health services in a school or somebody, those things lead to ways where people, people aren't being like, well, I'm gonna turn on my, you know, education policy, you know, part of my life today, and then I'm going to turn in my housing policy in my life. These things have to be built together. And I think no, no area has more opportunity for innovation to build these systems of care than in rural communities. So I just put those three areas and I know Mr. Hargan will likely have more, but I think those are th three things that I think could really be future for state and local innovation. And some of that could filter up to the federal level. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, this, there is obviously a long, <laughs> there, there's a lot of area for improvement right there, obviously, on those areas. And people have tried to unify some of those services. And I think that a lot of those attempts to unify might have taken place in a time in which there was probably less sophisticated information technology that maybe with better and better abilities to kind of communicate, share data, it's quicker, it's more sophisticated, that we're getting to a place where the ability to do that, at least from a technological point, is possible. Question is, there's all those areas of trust too, right? People getting in their silos, people getting situations of trust. One of the big areas is opioids, right? Substance use issues. Always a big problem. Why? There's a bunch of a bunch of agencies will say, we need to address homelessness. Now we need to address their healthcare needs. We need to do treatment now. We need to do prevention, no recovery. Well, it's really a law enforcement issue, right? Um, they're doing illegal things and, and it causes public safety issues for many of these kinds of drugs. And 
by the way, what about the veterans issues? What about transportation and jobs? They need jobs, right? There's, it turns into an ability where people, this is the peril and the promise of social determinants, right? Which is that everybody knows they matter. Everybody knows they matter. Um, which ones matter more? Which ones matter when? And who is in the room when we're talking about them, right? I mean, Huntington, West Virginia did a, has a great program, 12 agencies all dealing with opioids. They all sit in a hub and they all communicate uh, amongst each other, right? Um, they actually got me going on my part two reforms because I really, I asked the administrator, I said, how many part two forms do you issue each day? She said 11 per encounter. I said, okay, that's got to stop. That's an arcane area, but it's uh, and it's not well known, but there's all kinds of problems with communicating with each other and partnering. Lots of stuff has to be reformed to allow places and trust has to develop. In rural areas, I think that can happen, right? It's a lot easier in a rural area for this kind of, these kind of uh, partnerships to develop than there are in larger cities where there's just a lot more siloed um, they're larger institutions. There's a greater ability for them to silo and focus on their own needs as an institution. I think in rural areas, there's a great deal of help, uh, the abilities to do those kind of things. Now, one of the things you were talking about, uh, Wi-Fi and all that. So one place to look here, hopefully this will develop over time, although we, my sort of last trip in office in January 2021 was to launch the Rural Health Broadband Initiative. Uh, which is led out of Alaska, where all help is rural <laughs> in Alaska uh, or remote. I mean, it's more so frontier and so on. Um, in that uh, particular initiative, the first year, it's a five year initiative sponsored by uh, some strange bedfellows, Health and Human Services, the Department of Agriculture, and the Federal Communication Commission uh, are all dealing rural health broadband. So all three came together to cooperate on. A five year thing. The first year was just assessment. So they had five different uh, states that were assessing different parts of the country, but Alaska was lead um, on the state of rural health broadband because when we started digging into it, some parts of rural America are actually pretty well provided in broadband. And some are, there's nothing there, and some places it's patchy. So the first year, which end, should have ended January of this year, so four months ago, was the assessment year. Then four years is supposed to be providing the resources and the build out to help start addressing the issues of rural health broadband. So that it was it was that exact issue that kind of came to the front. FCC had been doing some work on its own on this issue, uh, and then we all decided to kind of club together and do some collective stuff, get a little memo and agreement together, and launch the project. So I would say watch that space, hold their feet to the fire. Uh, that they continue to move forward on it and don't just endlessly assess and reassess and plan and plan again, right? And instead move forward and actually bring some relief in this respect uh, to rural areas. I mean, you know, when you were talking about some of these programs, getting them into people's homes, there have been tons of studies on this area that can, can be done. I mean, if parts of it are, are technological, remote patient monitoring, there's a program that University of Mississippi did in one of their most rural counties with one of their most difficult populations, morbid, obese, morbidly obese. They did a program there, remote patient monitoring is a high, high tech, but also high touch program where they had people calling, nurses aides and so on calling. Our first pass at that, it took 18 months for these several hundred patients before they ever showed up in the hospital. And I mean this, and I'll tell you, when we launched it, I thought this won't work because Coming from a country area, I thought they're not going to want to call from some, you know, nurse's aide calling them three times a day. That's going to be annoying. They're not going to like it. Turns out I was completely wrong. Um, they were shut-ins, and the, if they saw their kids occasionally, that's who they saw. They didn't get out um, because of weight issues and, you know, um, ability to get around transportation, frankly. Um, and uh, they loved it. And there were huge, it was a huge positive. Uh, the report came out at the beginning of 2020. So guess what everybody was concentrating on? Not this, 
the pandemic. So it, again, like many of the things that came out in the last couple of years, good programs, great ideas submerged in the, in the, the public health impact of the pandemic. So there's great stuff out there, but it's going to be technology, like I said, rural health broadband that we were talking about, and it's going to be workforce as well. That ability, not ability to get specialists. How are we going to deal with the workforce in the future? Will we get doctors into a local community or will we end up with, do we need to talk about other ways of getting workforce in nurses, aides, all kinds of other extenders into the community with technological resource and education to kind of try to crack these problems and extend actual personal health care uh, into these communities. So I'm hopeful. I think, you know, my mother was an X-ray tech, so I've got a soft spot. In my, uh, I've got a soft spot in my heart for the techs, uh, the aides, the techs, the aides, the extenders, everybody kind of uh, downstream from the doctors and the nurses. Um, and parts of my family are doctors and nurses too. So, no, nothing against them, but there's a role to play here in rural America uh, for everybody uh, in this space. So, sorry, I have got a bit of a soapbox there about it, but um, not not pure policy, but I just say, I think there's great uh, straws in the wind here for uh, for where things can go technologically and workforce way as well. Well, that, that segues into another question and that is where do our Illinois rural communities go from here? What, what, are, um, what actions uh, are called for at this point? In our communities, both our healthcare communities, right, and and our our uh, general community. Yeah, doctor, what do you think? Oh, you're muted. Trying to be um, gracious with not having background noise, then you forget to unmute. Right, that's the the two year struggle of the pandemic. Uh, I think it's a great question, and I think part of the hope. Um, with series just like this is we want to be able to share the stories of innovations, right? I think, and then to Mr. Hargan's point, right, that there are these really unique and important policy conversations happening, but will it translate from Washington, D.C. or Springfield, Illinois into our rural communities and will it be impactful, right? And I think that is an important place where understanding that, finding the right kind of partnerships, because ultimately if it, it's great in theory, but if it doesn't work in those practical considerations, it's not gonna happen. And it, it does require sometimes some investment, some new ways of thinking. And I think our hope, and because we see it all the time, is that it's happening all the time. How can we better show that it's working? And so, We'd encourage all the folks that are here who are listening to it afterwards. We want to be able to tell those stories of innovations in rural health care and then finding the right ways to modify, you know, maybe make new policy. But I think the other thing that Mr. Hargan sort of mentioned really thoughtfully is that a lot of this stuff is regulations within different agencies of those things. There's a huge space in which those things could be better modified to ultimately improve rural health outcomes. Yep. Yep. So we do so have a few questions that we want to get to, but we have one more sort of uh, uh, discussion question. Uh, and that is um, uh, success models. Um, could you, do you have some success models to share with us that you think this is and and I think you've mentioned some. Uh, mentioned a mentioned couple, that, right? I mean, a program right. in Miss, in Mississippi. In Mississippi, I think. yeah. And if I had a question, at, one of our uh, uh, participants wanted to get some more information about that. So maybe that's a good way to to segue. Sure, to this that's question. a good that's a good segue. Yeah, it was uh, in Sunflower County. Um, I'm going to guess you can Google it. I wish I had. I don't. I, I should have brought the little name of the grant, uh, we could probably get the link to it, uh, to the final report. It came out, our final report to HHS was February of 2020. Uh, and uh, so we had it posted, uh, but it was it was uh, from University of Mississippi, so Ole Miss, uh, and it was Sunflower County. 
uh, tracking, as I say, morbidly obese with this interesting high tech, high touch model. And as I say, and we saw it developing over time, it was already successful. So this was the final, it's been going on for several years. Um, this sort of, and Mississippi has been building it out. Uh, if Mississippi can do this in a rural Mississippi, it can be done in rural Illinois. That's for sure in terms of the resources available. Um, that's my, that's my belief. I think it's a, that's one promise in here, but that's just one, you know, this is this population in uh, there's a lot more to be done. Um, and there were lots of cases like this having the pandemic. I see that there's, I mean, it, there, I think that there are a lot of programs. I mean, like I said, the training, the trainers program, project echo, I think if you all wanted to do that, call Dr. Aurora, if you don't have his number, I'll get it to you. Uh, for him to do him and his team to help train on some of these these kinds of areas, which they do all the time. And, and SIU does have kind of a, a robust uh, project echo program. Uh, you know, for those that don't know, it's extension for community health care outcomes. And, and as Mr. Hargan mentioned, you know, trying to get some of the special lists that we have here in Springfield with the School of Medicine to really think through our 66 county region of how can we you know, train the trainer, but also build the types of relationships between general providers and specialists. Because I think we know, we know healthcare can be complicated. And sometimes the, the amazing ability of our kind of rural providers to practice medicine, I, I think it's, it's incredible, but there has to sometimes be the support that's built and, and Project ECHO is one, but there are other opportunities uh, of things to really connect the pieces to provide, you know, the infrastructure either with people or with technology that might be just lacking in a smaller rural community. We we do have a question too about the idea of mobile clinics, um, and the 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 uh, participant asks uh, observes that uh, there are mobile dental clinics, and of course we haven't even touched on dental care as part of healthcare in rural America. Very very important. But what about mobile medical clinics? Is there is there such a thing, uh, really, uh, in a meaningful way? And could it be more um, oh, yeah. uh, enhanced? Sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you uh, there is there are entire areas where mobile clinics are seriously one of the main ways of getting healthcare. Uh, now, you know whether it's dental, general, general practice. I don't know about a mobile surgery clinic, doctor. You could tell me if that if those things exist. But dental drug screening. This was one of the surprises of the pandemic for me was the fact that we we were not getting people into uh, you know how are they going to get to do their daily sort of check ins uh, for drug screening and and those kinds of things. And it was again a rural area that developed. There was a clinic in a rural area that uh, had a had a developed drug screening. That's the first time I had seen it where they're mobily going out to people's homes and doing drug screening uh, because our clinicians said there will be no tele drug <laughs> issues because we need to see the patient. We need to have trust in them before we, you know, there was a lot of idea of you having to have person to person interaction with somebody who is in a state of addiction or substance use disorder. Um, and they said, how can that be done when they're not going to come into the clinic? When they're not going to come to the hospital, they sent them out to them. So and to get the also to you know get the uh, tests done and screening done. So it happened everywhere. We had telepodiatry. I mean, <laughs> as a major thing in the in the in all this. But you may have more local uh, examples. Yeah, I think there's um, you know, and this is a place where. Where SIU has a, a care a van, you know, and I know other places have it, right? The ability to kind of do mobile clinic to try to travel in remote places. I think one of the things that is another place for innovation. Well, how do you? So how do you appropriately staff something like that with the number of specialists? How can you coordinate that? I think that's a place that that's ripe for some innovation. And then, how does this look? from a routine schedule, right? I think sometimes clinics have a hard time being able to, you know, fully make it part of their healthcare operations 
because they don't have a sense of like how many people are going to come in right and and how to do that but i think if we can build it and i think this is the big thing that um some of the work that we're, we're hoping to be able to spur innovation is that some of these conversations of how do we assess the right community need and then there's so much that's possible and i think mobile delivery of care in combination with technology technological delivery of care and then even the idea of like what kind of and, and our associate provost for external relations at SIU Lori Williams just mentioned this in a meeting to me today you know how do we really think about health at home more oh, right yeah, that's, you know yeah. and I think there's so much opportunity there too um and I, I think we're ripe for taking opportunities right now after um we've dealt and had to do so much innovation and continue to do because of the pandemic really put that into practice in our rural communities. Yeah, it's going mean, to require partnership and it's going to require kind of honest conversations. Just talking to these big home health companies about how they do it. I mean, they're already doing health care at homes. The, like that, that's ripe for, I think, probably fruitful discussions is to bring the people that know how to do this and it's sustainable financially for them to really start dealing just as an offshoot of the fact that hospital, the 20th century model of like, bring everybody to a central hospital, they're all treated at the central hospital, then you go home is going away in my opinion. And decentralized care is everywhere, uh, not just in rural America by force of nature, but in everywhere in the US. Ever, that is where that is what's happening is community health, whatever that means, is happening everywhere. They're, the healthcare system is spreading out and decentralizing. And I think rural America could be the beneficiary of those, those innovations that are happening. We're about out of time. I do have a, one, one other question that I'd just like to ask. And with the end of, I guess, and this may show my ignorance, but with the end of the public health emergency, okay, what ha is is telehealth on a clear path for uh, from a legal and regulatory standpoint, or are there issues that are going to have to be addressed to continue and 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 uh, uh, telehealth's growth? Uh, well, for non-rural areas, it goes away. That's it. Uh, unless Congress takes action to extend it or make it permanent, it's gone. Uh, there is not, there is no, I mean, I literally, I asked our legal staff at HHS to really, really examine this question. Um, it goes away. And I think that I was just having that discussion literally last night uh, with one of the associations that deals with telemedicine here in DC. So uh, Congress keeps thinking about it um, to try to fix it. It stays in rural America. We added as uh, we added maybe twelve new services on that were we said in rural areas uh, they could be provided. We kind of put put by regulation we put a number of sort of tried to fill in the cracks, but they it's rural um, and so areas that aren't rural either even small metros don't will not have that benefit of telemedicine unless action is taken by Congress uh, to make it so. It just will not persist. Under the terms of the CARES Act passed in 2020, it goes away when the emergency goes away. Yeah, and just quickly on that in Illinois, um, you know, the governor signed a bill last July that kind of thought through insurance reimbursement parity for virtual mental health and substance use services and kind of authorizing all other telehealth to be covered through 2027. But obviously what that means is still open to, you know, some interpretation. Yeah. Medicare will not be. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's a big. Yes, it is indeed. <laughs> well, we, my clock on my, on my computer here just ticked over to one o'clock. Um, and, uh, I think this was just a great conversation, and and I hope our participants uh, out in uh, in the electronic uh, universe uh, enjoyed themselves as much as I did. Thank you to both of you for just um, a really informative and interesting conversation, and I look forward 
to addition, you know, further um, uh, events in the innovating uh, rural healthcare program. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Bye. long.